H T E double N E B N H O J spells hidden hypnage. It's a name as you can see. It's the same name for me. H T E double N E B N H O J. It couldn't be worse. It's my name in reverse. John Bennett, that's me. Hi, thanks for tuning into my video. Clicking, clicking on my video. Give me those precious views. Hey, could you share this with somebody, please? Please, I'll be your friend. If you do, your best friend, your only friend. And I get to pet my dog, Hudson. Say hi to everybody, Hudson. My co-host. What do you want? He wants to be fed. Dogs want to be fed. Say, yeah, feed your dog. Well, you're probably wondering why I'm wearing a fool's cap. Why I'm singing a stupid song. It's because I'm a fool. I'm a fool for you, baby. A fool for love. I'm a fool for homeopathy. That's what I am. I was watching a uh, documentary on physical proving for homeopathy, which was done by, well, it wasn't exactly physical proving, it was more like a biochemical proving, done by Luc Montagny, replicating the work of Jacques Benveniste, who was replicating the work of Poitivin. The biochemical test, basophil degranulation test for homeopathy is a biochemical test studying the reaction of basophils to homeopathic remedy stimulus. So they took a drop of what skeptics insist is pure water and drop it into a solution full of white blood cells, which would theoretically not be stimulated by any water like that, which suddenly start releasing antigens, basophils, go out and get the bad guys, the immune reaction. Well, this is impossible, say the skeptics. He must be a fraud whoever the he, must, he is at the time. It's been about 24 replications between 1988 when it was first done successfully by Poitivin to I think the Wit Review reported on the last Basilville degranulation test being done, I think 2004. I could be wrong about that. But they recorded, they made note of, the WIT review made note of 24 um, replications of the basophilic granulation test in that amount of time. A test that skeptics still insist hasn't been replicated. That Benveniste was a fool, a fool, I tell you. So in the, in the view of making like cure like, I thought I'd better dress up like a fool because they absolutely crucified Jacques Benveniste for doing that test. He lost his funding, lost his career. He was the director of INSERM, which is the French national, the French national research, medical research branch of government. I'm not sure what the exact words that INSERM stands for. But that's what it was, and Benveniste was a uh, director for INSERM. So he was very, very well respected by the medical, sci the sci medical science community and uh, was, a, was a, a potential candidate for the Nobel Prize for his work. I, I forget now exactly what it was that distinguished him before he got involved in homeopathy, which ruined him, it absolutely it killed him. 
I think he died an early death because of that. I got an email from him once. I was, he was on my list. I put him on my list for the proving back in 1999. And he wrote me and said, homeopathy is a devil's piss pot. That's all he had to say to me. Homeopathy is a devil's piss pot. I was interested in, at that time, various tests for homeopathy. I wasn't too well informed about what he had done at that time. So I really missed out on an opportunity to get to know him better. Anyway, Montagnier, Luc Montagnier, the Nobel Prize winning scientist who won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the HIV virus, made the mistake of replicating Benveniste. I, there's a pretty interesting video on it. I think it's called The Memory of Water. Jacques Benveniste and his cohorts his partners in crime. And lo and behold, they did the same thing to Montagnier, what they did to Ben Beniste. They ran him out of town. He ended up in China, I think. And he's got, a, I think he's got a clinic down in Ghana, but he was subjected to what he described as intellectual terrorism for having replicated this impossible test of science that they can't explain. So, I'm here with something even, with even worse news. Not only am I telling you that there have been numerous tests that have proven the action of these materials at a subatomic level, as well as molecular, whatever you think that might mean, that have proven it and been replicated numerous times. So not only am I telling you that, that there are these tests that exist that prove homeopathy, the action of these, these are real materials that have biochemical action on the human constitution. I'm telling you that I have basically the description of what's happening here, of what the process is, what BMJ, the British Medical Journal was begging for, the mechanism of the homeopathic remedy. As far as I know, I'm the only guy that's spreading the bad news right now, that there is an identifiable mechanism for that. So to protect myself, I mean, that's what they did to uh, Ben Venise and Montagnier. What do you think they'd do to me? They'd try to kill me. They've almost done it. I mean, I'm a, I'm a walking, talking dead man, as far as I can tell. I can barely move sometimes. As I described in an earlier video, I've been diagnosed with Parkinsonism. It's like Parkinson's, but it's not exactly that. They don't know what it is. It's only something that I can figure homeopathy can treat. They give me all dopamine for it, but I still move kind of slow sometimes. And my life is accordingly miserable from it. I've had it, I've been struggling with this for a couple of years now. At least. It took them a long time to Say, well, it's Parkinsonism. You know, how is it that these guys get diseases named after them? They're even named after the victim or the guy that made him a victim, the doctor that identified it as that guy's name. You know, they name a disease after either him or the, either he gets the credit or the, they give the due credit to the guy with Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or Lou Gehrig. There's, you know, Lou Gehrig, they really specified who they were talking about with Lou Gehrig. They just didn't call it Gehrig's disease. They called it Lou, not Joe Gehrig, not Larry Gehrig. Lou Gehrig. Poor Gehrig. Well, anyway, I would like to have that distinction as well. I think I have what it could be called John Bennett's disease. Given my particular symptoms for it. And as somebody who's been trained in homeopathy or has studied it for a long time, I should be able to come up with a cure. Shouldn't I? Well, shouldn't I? Of course. Lycopodiums helped me. I, I took a dose of lycopodium and the next day I felt like running, running. So you know what I did? I did. I started running. You know, when before I was going through periods where I could barely stand up, I just suddenly started running after taking lycopodium, homeopathic lycopodium. You would have never guessed it now, would you? He's lying. Well, I have been known to lie. 
But I'm so good at lying, I can tell the truth lying. Just like to remind you, though, of those that uh, have already heard that, as a means of an introduction for those that haven't. So anyway, my main function here is to tell you what it is. And I've been slow, basically, to explain this or write about it. I've written a 13-page, 15-page paper on it. But as usual, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of wacky, my own wacky way. But it's backed up by conventional scientific terms. I mean, these, these things are known. And I'll basically give away the key point, which is molecular dissociation. You find that the, um, these materials have been tested physically. And what they've noted in this through NMR testing, which has been a, probably a couple dozen NM, NM, published MNR, nuclear magnetic resonance tests on homeopathy. And uh, dielectric, there's the dielectric stress test, which is my favorite. It's the one I submitted to James Randi for the million dollar challenge, the phony fake, fake challenge. You give a million dollars. He promised he'd give, give me the million dollars if I could prove homeopathy. I came, I said, well, if I come up with a method that will identify one solution. This is back in 1999. If I come up with a method to identify one solution from a homeopathic solution from a placebo, inert, a dummy, in a double blind child, will that win the money? He goes, yeah, just do it and take the money. He said that. He wrote that to me. And then when I came up with a test, he, he turned tail and had a heart attack. Out, he went to China to investigate the Qigong and had a heart attack. And said, I told everybody I was crazy. So anyway, that's a whole different story what I did next. He said I ruined JREF for him, the James Randi Educational Foundation. I don't think it's true, but if people want to believe it, I'll be proud of it. I don't see how it ruined it. I mean, he went on lying about homeopathy, right and left. Hey, you know what? He was on Ted the TED Talks. For homeopathy, giving this 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 phony spiel about Avogadro's number that there's not one molecule in it after the 23rd dilution, and then he takes a handful of sleeping pills. Mm -hmm. You can hear him swallow. Mm -hmm. See, I'm still here. I haven't. I'm not asleep. It didn't knock me out. What a fool! I mean, first he said he said they start demand. He's one of the. He's the king of the skeptics, and they all want to see a double blind gold standard trial of these substances, which they keep insisting there's never been one and never will be. And he comes up with standing on stage, dumping something in his mouth as his demonstration that homeopathy doesn't work. I mean, why not just not take it and say it didn't work? You know, you say, well, if you wanted a stronger dose of homeopathic medicine, Take the medicine. Okay, then don't take and see what happens. I mean, that's how stupid the whole thing is. But then I'm a fool, aren't I? I'm such a fool for believing in homeopathy. So anyway, that brings us to the interesting thing that they found out through testing. Boy, I can just barely keep track here of what I'm supposed to be talking about. They found out that to structuring, they get this through NMR and spectroscopic studies that water begins to structure the influence of these remedies. Hi, it's structuring through the hydrogen bonds of the water molecule that does this. They found that, that there was this unique structuring that would occur, get this at the, at the sixth decimal dilution, the sixth dilution, suddenly the structuring, hydrogen bond structuring appears in the water in the solution of the, uh, of the homeopathic solution. Well, it just so happens that that's ex exactly the same spot with the dielectric stress, the con conductivity of water takes a leap when there shouldn't be anything in it instead of, well, let me put it this way, in the dielectric stress test, they're testing the puncture voltage of, of, the, of the solution. And in the first five, the, as you would expect, the conductivity goes down, like you're basically diluting, let's say, salt. So in the first, uh, first, first dilution, 
dilute it one to 10. In the second dilution, you dilute it one to 10. So by the sixth dilution, you're at like one part per million. And guess what? That's exactly, well, sometimes not exactly, sometimes it's the seventh dilution. That's approximately when suddenly the conductivity of the solution reverses itself and starts showing that there's actually something in the water. Well, there couldn't be anything in the water. We've, we're dilating it out. It's, it's going the wrong way. And then it goes down, starts going down again. Well, that's more like it. Conductivity begins to drop. You know, what I'm talking about is water increases its conduct, electrical conductivity when there's something in it, like salt. As you dilute it out, theoretically, the conductivity should drop, right? Until it becomes pure water and it's not, the conductivity is lousy, pure water, compared to when it has a full load of salt in it or something else. So the question is, why is it suddenly dropping at that point? Well, theoretically, and this is according to Copeland in a paper that he wrote back in the 1909, and I think that this theory came up with this Professor Jones at John Hopkins University or something like this. At that point, which would be the one part per million, the original solute, molecular solute, suddenly ionizes. In other words, the action of the hydrogen molecule, hydrogen oxygen molecule, H2O, is that of a pro, it's protic, it donates hydrogen. So when it comes in contact with a particle, it kind of goes after it with its hydrogen venom inserting it. The, you know, the hydrogen, the hydrogen atom is the smallest basic unit. That's the fractal, the basic fractal. And so it's able to get into just about anything. You know, it's the cosmotrope, it's the smallest particle. And we have found that structuring occurs around the smallest particle, which is essentially the, the electron. So at that point of dilution, suddenly the conductivity goes up again, then it goes down, like in the eighth dilution, and it goes back up and goes back down, it oscillates. But it never gets to the point of, of where undiluted water is, it stays in this in this waveform, which is a waveform that we see in most of these tests, that at one dilution, it'll be doing one thing, at the other, it'll be doing the next, another one. So it goes up and down, which is an oscillating wave. In other words, the solute, the molecular solute, has ionized, or actually it's deionized, and it's ionized the water with its electricity, its electron. And that continues indefinitely. That's the expanding electro electron that I've mentioned before. So there you have the basic theory for how it is that these solutions at any dilution can maintain the specificity of the solute in its action biochemically. How's that for a sentence off the top of my head? Well, I'm just a fool. I'm a fool for you. So that's, that's my... Uh, that's my scientific lecture for the day. I suppose I ought to tell a joke or something. The, uh, I've suggested that we have a t-shirt made. It says free will. I've got this uh, thing about, can anybody out there prove free will to me? Let me prove it. Can you prove free will? I bet you can't. I'll, I'll give a million dollars to anybody who can prove free will to me on the terms that Randy laid out for his challenge, million dollar challenge to homeopathy. How do you like them apples? How do you skeptics like that? Huh? I'll pay you a million dollars if you can prove, if you can prove to me, the fool, prove to the fool that you have free will, prove your free will. I don't mean by taking a swing at me, that doesn't prove anything. So do that. Anyway, so I was thinking it's a part of this campaign have a t-shirt made that says free will on it and then hand them out to prisoners in uh, in U.S. prisons, in the home of the brave and the land of the free. Land of the brave, home of the free? Or is it home of the brave and land of the free? It's both, isn't it? Well, the, the brave guys start picking on the free guys. <laughs> so the brave guys are stopping, stopping, 
start cutting for short the freedoms on the on the free guys. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't thought of that before. So anyway, I really enjoy your comments, the people who have been commenting. And you could really help me out if you'd share. I know it's a hard thing to do sometimes, just share. But, but it would really help me out. I'd like to see millions of people listening and hanging on every word of mine. And yours too. I mean, who's the great genius here? You, you know you know about the great genius, don't you? Nostradamus? Nostradamus? Check it out. 20 minutes. 